Uh, hi, my name is Alexei. Um, I'm a research assistant and PhD student at the Imperial College in London. And today I'll talk about Velvet Forks. Now I see some of you already noticed the Pokemon reference. So yeah, pain skills. Um, okay, let's see if we go. Yeah. Okay, so I mean, the motivation behind this talk is quite simple. So I mean, you all know how Bitcoin works, so I don't need to go into detail about the consensus mechanism. But it's important to remember that um, in Bitcoin, we have a dynamically changing set of pseudonymous participants. That means anyone can leave and join the network at any time. And when we want to introduce a consensus rule update, right, we need a majority of participants to say, OK, yeah, fine, I will change and I will upgrade. And a participant in this sense it's a, is a miner. Now, um, of course, the majority, that's in the theoretical case. Actually, you need a super majority or ideally everyone to join your update. Otherwise, you can end up with a train split. And we usually don't want to have multiple parallel chains of Bitcoin running around. So the thing is, today we want to talk about something that does not cause a chain split and never can cause a fork, ideally. And it's not a soft fork, it's not a hard fork, it's called differently, it's a velvet fork. Now before we continue, let's just recall what a hard and soft fork is. Um, and I'll personally, I don't very much like this gray, black and white definition of hard and soft forks. So I mean, a hard fork is a descriptive name for something that will cause a permanent chain split, right? A soft fork, on the other hand, tries to maintain some level of compatibility with old clients to prevent a permanent chain split from happening. Now, the funny thing about this is, if we assume economically rational actors, so we can always you know, argue about this one, um, if me and my three friends decide, yeah, well, I'm gonna do a hard fork because I feel that I'll benefit from this economically, but then only us three actually join in, well, then, yeah, probably our fork will be not worth anything, and yeah, we'll stop. But on the other hand, a soft fork, if a soft fork does not gain majority, for example, only 30% of the people actually, you know, join upgrade to the soft fork, well, it will fail. And when it fails, it will cause a permanent chain split, except if the 30% then say, okay, fine, we, will, we won't fork. So, and, and this kind of, this confusion, um, it's a bit tricky. So, and also it does not cover the notion of so, uh, velvet forks. So this is why we propose a slightly different view on forks. Um, yeah, being coming from academia, we always like to introduce some notations and so on, but this is not so important. Um, just from this slide, is it, the interesting part is that we have a protocol set, a uh, rule of protocol rules P, and then we denote the validity set of blocks as V, and the validity set is basically all blocks that are valid under these rules P. Now, tables are usually bad for presentations, so if you're interested and want to go into detail, we have a short paper on that where we try to you know, put everything together in a few pages. But we differentiate, instead of saying, okay, only hard and soft forks, we say, well, okay, fine, there is an expanding, reducing, and a conflicting way to introduce updates. And some of them, so the reducing uh, update will usually be the soft fork, right? But it also can, in the worst case, cause a hard fork. So it depends on the specific case. So now let's talk about velvet forks. So in a velvet fork, what we do is we make sure that the rules are applied only conditionally. And this is why we will not need a majority to actually participate in our protocol update. Now this sounds a bit awkward, so, so how does it work? So if we look at the four blocks here, right, let's assume that they are all valid under the Bitcoin rules. So a legacy Bitcoin miner, I'm sorry for calling legacy Bitcoin, it's just easier to say upgrade it and not upgrade the whole time. So legacy Bitcoin miner will say, yeah, well, B1, B2, B3, B4, they're all valid, perfect. Now, let's say I'm a velvet fork miner. So I'm a, I have some new protocol rules that we introduced with a few friends and we're using Bitcoin for this. And we have some data in, in the Bitcoin blocks, which is marked blue, right? So I'll go and I'll look at the blockchain. And I'll say, okay, block B1, it's valid in the Bitcoin block rules, perfect. And then I'll check the data that's, that's there and I'll say, okay, fine. The data that I need is there. I check if it's valid, and if it's valid, perfect. I accept this block also under the new rules. Now, what happens, however, if the data is not there, or if it's corrupted, invalid? Well, I'll still accept the Bitcoin block, and that's the trick. So what I'll do is I'll build a skip list of my upgraded blocks, but make sure that I accept all Bitcoin blocks as they are as well. So you get this kind of skip list, and this is how you make sure that it never causes a fork. So you basically make sure that new and old miners accept the same set of blocks. And this is what's actually a velvet non-fork. So the name is not my invention, sorry for that. Um, but yeah, but not, do note the star, that it never caused the chain split. We'll come back to that in a second. So if we now go back to this fancy table with a lot of symbols, um, the only reason we have the table is just to show that 
Um, if you make sure that the validity set is the same before and after the update, that means you accept the same set of blocks as the legacy miners, you won't fork. Except if the legacy miners don't like your update and decide to tr prevent you from introducing this velvet fork by forking themselves. So they will actually have to make a soft or hard fork to prevent you from um, in introducing your velvet protocol update. But I would argue that's not really possible because all I need to be able to do is include some piece of data in, in the Bitcoin blockchain. And of course, you can try to prevent me, you know, from including, for, you can ban me from using op return, you can ban co the Coinbase field. But I mean, essentially, I could even encode some data in, in some address format, right? So arguably, a velvet fork, you can't really prevent it from happening. And this is good, but it's and bad at the same time, as we'll see later. Now, the term velvet fork is quite new. It's been introduced only in 2017, but the concept of having such conditionally reducing protocol updates. So conditionally reducing means that you reduce the overall set of blocks that's accepted. So that's usually a soft fork, but because it's conditional, it's a velvet fork. And I'm not quite sure which one was proposed first. I know that P2Pool was launched before merge mining was introduced to Namecoin, but these two were the first kind of velvet protocol updates. And then followed by colored coins, overlay protocols, weak, the notion of weak blocks and subchains. Um, Blockstack has their own velvet fork kind of approach. And then uh, recently, basically, with the non-interactive proofs of proof of work paper, which is an improved approach to SPV proofs. Um, they introduced the term velvet forks, and we basically picked that up and looked further into it. Now, it's always a bit difficult, you know, to explain these concepts abstractly, so I'll use Pituple as an example uh, to explain how this actually works in practice. So I think most of you know Pituple. Who does not know Pituple is? Okay, well, let's we'll still go through it. So Pituple is a decentralized mining pool, and the goal here is that we want to remove the centralized operator, right? So the concept is the same. We use shares to prove to the pool that we invested some amount of computational effort into solving the next proof of work solution. Um, but the main difference is the way that the miners agree on how much money each of them will get paid from the next block award. And the difference here is that P2Pool uses an additional blockchain for that. Um, they call it the share chain, and it's not really the blockchain as a sense of Bitcoin because it's temporary. It's actually a lethal list of blocks or block headers, and it gets pruned. So when, when a new one comes in, the last one falls out, and I think it's about 8,000 blocks long. And the goal here is that if you want to participate in Pitupu, you commit yourself the moment you start mining a block, and you will say, okay, I will include everyone who was able to publish one of these shares um, and include into the share chain, I will reward each and one of you in the Coinbase output. So on the example here, so A starts and assume he's the first one, right? So there's no one else. And then B finds a share, includes A as well in the payout and both get half. And then C finds a, finds a share and everyone gets a third. Finally, A is the one who finds the full block. I have a pointer. And then A will basically include all of the other sh weak blocks or shares in this sense and pay everyone out. And he'll get half of the block reward and the rest and transaction fees and the rest will get one fourth each. I mean, P2Pool has more details, more specific ways to incentivize honest participation, but this is the basic idea how it works. Now, the cool thing about this is that while all this is happening, this is what the legacy miners see. So they have no clue what's going on, right? They don't care about what P2Pool is doing. They basically just see that, okay, well, fine. This block pays out these, four, these three miners, and that's it. And I would argue they won't even be able to differentiate between a normal mined block by a centralized mining pool and P2Pool. So basically, that's the, the essence of a velvet fork. You make sure that nobody cares about your protocol update except for the people who actually participate. Now, the thing is, after so I gave a presentation at the Financial Crypto, and then people were some people were quite hyped and say, "Yeah, well, cool. This is the new way to introduce protocol updates." But velvet forks don't always work. They don't. That's not like a new, completely new thing. It's been around for some time, and I'd like to point out some of the limitations of the velvet fork. So. Velvet forks do not work when you need to enforce rules across all participants. So basically, if I want to make sure that everyone um, knows and everyone follows the rules, well, then you can't use a velvet fork. And a good example is SegWit or Bitcoin NG. If, I, if, if someone spends th these outputs without knowing the rules, I will reject that block, right? But in a velvet fork, you can't do that. You must accept all blocks, so that's why it doesn't work. But that, that's, that's simple, that's clear. But the question is, okay, when, when can Velvet Fork lead, when can these updates lead to problems? And this is something which I don't, I'm not sure if everyone is aware of that. 
Um, because in a Velvet Fork, since participation is not mandatory, you do not, you do not longer have the same security assumptions as the underlying Bitcoin blockchain. And if we look at P2Pool, for example, and we can think of a potential attack, right? It's quite simple. So assume P2Pool is only 5% adoption. So 5% of the hash rate is in P2Pool. Now, they're happily mining and it's perfect and these three miners will split the share, the, the reward when the block is found. But then suddenly, apparently an attacker who has 10% of the overall Bitcoin hash rate, it would work with even less, but let's assume he's 10%, so he has way more computational power than the whole P2 pool. So what he can do is he can basically mine his own secret share chain, right? And publish it. So what he'll do, okay, well, he might even be as nice as to pay out the miners back there. So even if, if these miners found blocks back there, he might even pay them out, but he won't pay these three shares. And essentially, according to the rules, well, this, the, 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 the share chain that, that was previously valid, well, is no longer valid. And when they find, when one of these three finds a block, well, they would actually have to pay um, the, the attacker. So the thing is, it's important to understand that when you do these protocol updates where you don't require a majority to participate or don't require everyone to join in, you can't rely on the same security model as the underlying system. So another example is merge mining, right? So merge mining was initially introduced as an attempt to prevent the fragmentation of mining power across competing chains and um, also to help bootstrap systems with small cryptocurrencies like Namecoin. And the cool part is that, okay, yeah, well, anyone can join merge mining and decide which coins he would like to merge mine. I mean, it would be a bad idea to make it mandatory, right? Because you can't enforce people to mine your coin. I mean, that's, that doesn't work. But on the other hand, if you don't, if not everyone joins in, as in the case of Namecoin, well, then you won't get the same balance of mining power distribution as in Bitcoin. And this is exactly what happened. I mean, merge mining did work, just as P2Pool works, right? There have been no attacks, at least not that we are aware of, but the threat is potentially there. Because what happened with Namecoin, so do note um, these two figures are not aligned on time. Otherwise, Namecoin will be way too squished. So this, the blue line marks the introduction of merge mining, right? This is approximately somewhere around here. And we, what we do see, what is not in this figure, is that the difficulty of the Namecoin bl uh, blocks surged up. And the hash rate present on Namecoin, of course, increased. That's clear because a lot of mining pools, a lot of miners back then said, okay, cool, I get Namecoins for free while mining Bitcoin. That's nice. I don't have to do additional proof of work effort. What you do have to do, you have to run a node, right? You have to run a node that in addition to Bitcoin and you have these, well, what you get is the economies of scale. If you're a big miner, you don't mind. If you're a really small guy, well, this may actually, the additional bandwidth costs may prevent you from doing that. But what we saw in Namecoin is that uh, one or two big mining pools actually did control up to 80% of the blocks per day. And while I actually know from developers that they even helped them with some things, it's, it, the threat is there, right? So let's move on and think about, okay, but well, when do vel velvet forks actually work? And when does it make sense to use them? And when is it safe to use them? And it's safe if you don't need a majority and you don't want to enforce rules across all participants, but you simply want to build on top of the security properties of the underlying chain. And good examples are virtual chain by Blockstack or colored coins as we heard today, and also uh, the non-interactive proof of proof of work approach. Because these things, they work on a best effort basis. If you get this information included into the Bitcoin blockchain, great, perfect. If you don't, well, worst case, you'll lose some of your liveness properties, but safety is not an issue. Now, again, I don't say that P2Pool and Merge Mining don't work. They do, they achieve their purpose, but there are ways you could attack these systems. And even I mean, the 51% attack is not the only one you could, which P2Pool is vulnerable to. You can, there are methods which are even less detectable. So now let's think about Velvet Forks and you see, well, usually we'd say, yeah, well, it doesn't affect anyone else, right? It's me who introduces a protocol. Well, if I get attacked, it's my own fault. But I would argue that this is not always the case. And actually a Velvet Fork could, actually, could in fact um, impact the security assumptions of the legacy miners. And now it's because what happens is that the Velvet, with these new blocks, I mean, no longer have the same economic value to upgraded and non-upgraded miners. So like in the case of P2Pool, um, and this is an example I'll bring in a second. So and well, this changes from a scientific and academic perspective, right? So when we model all these double spending and selfish mining attacks, we assume, yeah, fine, well, the block is val is, is, has the same value to the attacker and to the honest miners. But what if that's not the case? 
And there's a really nice paper by Carlson et al. where they look at Bitcoin without the block reward and they evaluate by game theoretical methods what will happen. And what they saw and what they were able to show uh, is that if you don't have the block reward, then each block is explicitly measured by the transaction fees. And since they can vary significantly, each block has different values. And this allows you to better time attacks and you can bribe other miners to join your attack and so on. So this changes the model significantly, I'd say. So it's a good paper and I can, rent, I, I, I can recommend everyone to read it. And yeah, so to, to get the intuition, let's look at P2Pool. And let's assume that P2Pool has been accepted by 70% of the hash rate in Bitcoin, right? So 70% is mining in P2Pool, everyone's happy, it's decentralized, perfect. Now, they're mining uh, on this next block and we've got three shares and then suddenly a legacy block comes around, which does not pay any of the P2Pool miners. Well, this is fine, right? Because it's a velvet fork, we wanted, to, we wanted it to be a velvet fork. Perfect, we'll actually, we'll, we'll accept this block, right? But then suddenly we, we see, well, but there's this other block actually floating around as well. Maybe it was even mined slightly later than block 2A but it pays out all P2Pool miners. And since they are 70% of the hash rate, well, they'll be incentivized potentially, you don't know, but potentially they'll say, well, you know what? Even if the Bitcoin rules say we should accept block 2A, well, perhaps they'll say, no, actually this, one, this block to b pays us all. So why should we accept your legacy block? And because they're the majority, they'll basically be able to fork and enforce this on the other, on the other miners. So yeah, I mean, summarizing, Velvet Fork's a cool approach. I did, this talk is a bit more on the security aspects and also calls, you, calls people to be cautious with these approaches um, because it's a, nice, it's, it's a nice concept. You can do nice stuff with it, but you always should be aware that the security impacts may be there and you need to think about whether you, what, what your protocol actually needs. If you need the security assumptions in Bitcoin, well, then it doesn't work. Thanks a lot and happy to ask questions. Yeah. Yeah, well, an academic talk at 5 p.m. Yeah, <laughs> that's clear. Okay, awesome. Thanks.